tiene la gran virtud de eh, traer una en forma sistemática un conjunto de críticas que se han ido elaborando a lo largo del tiempo a lo que denominamos enfoque ortodoxo, enfoque neoclásico en economía. Son críticas que han sido, digamos, eh, eh, digamos parte en realidad de la, de, de, propio, de la propia historia del pensamiento económico y que él además considera que son de gran actualidad. El libro tiene además la gran eh, virtud de estar redactado de forma muy, muy clara, muy didáctica, muy conceptual. Eh, los desarrollos se pueden consultar en las páginas web que, que Steve eh, abre a la consulta de todos. Y realmente pinta, digamos así, un panorama muy, muy eh, fundamentado y muy interesante acerca de cuál es el estado actual del pensamiento económico. Eh, no los voy a, a distraer más, eh, creo que Steve tiene muchas cosas para contarnos, de manera que pasamos la palabra y seguramente ustedes van a disfrutar mucho esta conferencia. Sí, sí. Oh, well, thank you for the invitation. Can you hear me? Is this microphone working? Good. Uh, I apologize immediately to my translator, because I always speak too quickly. And I'll do my best to slow down for the audience here. So we are in an economic crisis unlike anything since the Great Depression. And the reason we are, partially, is economic theory itself. If economic theory hadn't been as totally misleading about the nature of capitalism, we would never have fallen into the financial trap we now find ourselves in. And uh, we've, done, we've fallen into that trap for a reason which is quite strange when you first see it expressed. It occurred to me in writing the second edition of the book, and that is that we are dominated by neoclassical economics, but fundamentally neoclassical economists don't understand neoclassical economics. They think they do, but they know it at such a superficial level that they are fundamentally wrong about their own theory. And my favorite example of this is the, uh, I think he's now chief of the IMF, economic chief. He was the founding editor of the American Economic Review Macro, Olivia Blanchard. And he wrote a paper that had that conclusion in about 2008. And he was talking about what's, what is known as the dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model of the economy. Just to, if I can poll the audience, how many people have heard of DSGE models? How many students have studied them? A few, okay. Most have done ISLM. But he was talking about this model and saying how it's simple, analytically convenient, and largely it's replaced ISLM for graduates and for research. And he said the advantage it has is that it's formally derived from maximization by firms and consumers. Now he wrote that paper, published that paper for the very first time as a working paper on the 13th of August, 2008. The crisis we are now in is regarded as having started on the 6th of August, 2007, a year and six days before he wrote that paper or published that paper. Quite bizarre. Now, after the crisis, of course, he changed his argument quite a bit. And he said, obviously, we didn't know as much as we thought we did about the economy. Um, but he said, one thing we shouldn't do is what he says, throw out the baby with the bathwater. In other words, we shouldn't throw away DSGE modeling just because it failed to predict the financial crisis. Well, my argument is very different. That baby should never have been conceived in the first place. It should never have become the basis of macroeconomics. And the reason is, fundamentally, that it's based on the wrong model. It's derived from the growth model first built by Robert Solo back in the 1950s and 60s. And Robert Solow is now a critic of DSGE modelling. And the reason he is a critic, though I'm not quite certain he's aware of this himself, is there's a fallacy behind its creation, which is known as the fallacy of strong reductionism. And I'll get onto that in a moment. But I'm so first of all, go through what Solow had to say about the crisis, about uh, DSGE models. Now, he said the prototypical model has an infinitely lived household, uh, the representative agent, who is both the consumer and the producer, the only entity in the entire economy, 
And he said, that is simply my growth model. And when he built it, he said, I was clear about one thing it didn't apply to, and that was short run fluctuations, the business cycle. He said, now any article that calls itself an article on the business cycle will use a slightly dressed up version of that model. And he said, the thing is, how on earth did this happen? He was stunned. And he said, let's say you're trying to defend why you use my growth model, Ramsey's as well, as the basis of macroeconomics. And he said, well, you might claim that economic theory has proven this is the only way you can model the macro economy. And he said, and I don't think you can say it more clearly, that claim is a delusion. Now, this is one of the leading neoclassicals of all time. Nobel Prize winner, one of the leading intellects that designed neoclassical theory, telling neoclassical macroeconomists that their views about macroeconomics are based on a delusion. Now, the foundation of that delusion are what he refers to as the Sonnenschein Mantel de Breur conditions, or SMD conditions for short. Now, again, a quick poll. Has anybody heard of those conditions before? Hand up, let's see. Uh, that's better than most economics audiences I talk to, two or three people. <coughs> there you go. <laughs> okay. Now, what those conditions proved was that a market demand curve, demand curve for a single market, can have any polynomial shape at all. Any shape you can describe by running, running a line along a page of paper and not taking a pa your hand off the page and not crossing over the curve you've already drawn. That is a valid market demand curve. And that means that you can't uh, imagine that that market demand curve necessarily slopes down. Because the market demand curve that does slope down is an individual one, not one involving more than one person, and not in an economy with more than one product. Of course, you have to have an economy with more than one person to even talk about prices. So what that actually proves is the SMD conditions prove that what's called the law of demand and taught to students in first year microeconomics as a law only applies to a single individual. And if you happen to sum several individuals, let's say I'm talking about Robinson Crusoe and Man Friday on their island in Daniel Defoe's story, then that may well be Crusoe's demand curve for bananas. And that could be Man Friday's demand curve for bananas. And when I add them together, this is the market demand curve for bananas on their island. That's a perfectly valid neoclassical market demand curve. Now, of course, you're not told that by your textbooks, which is why I'm here. But what I see is happening in this particular proposition, proven in part by an Argentinian economist, is proof by contradiction. Now again, this is something, if you're a mathematician, you know about it immediately, but again, has anybody heard of the concept of proof by contradiction? A few, okay, not a lot, okay. The idea is you assume something, you, you, you do not know the answer to some question. So you assume the answer is yes, and then you work through the logic and find that you get to a point where you contradict part of how you define the problem, and therefore you know the answer is actually no. Okay? That's how you prove the existence of irrational numbers working from a, a, a right-angled triangle. So in this case, the, the neoclassical economists effectively assumed that the market demand curve did obey the law of demand, so it sloped down. They then derived the conditions under which that was true, and they contradicted the conditional conditions of more than one consumer and more than one commodity, which therefore proves that it do, the market demand curve does not necessarily slope down. Now, to show you the logic of this, I'm going to go into a bit of detail here because I do have some time. The idea of a law of demand is derived from what's called the Hicksian compensated demand curve. And that then considers changing prices for one commodity while holding the other one and income constant. And then adjusting for the fact that dropping the price effectively makes you better off by reducing the amount you have until you're back on the same utility indifference curve. If you haven't done it, that's the basic background to it. 
So you start off from this idea. You start from saying, let's imagine varying the price of one commodity while keeping all of the prices and the income of the individual consumer constant. And then you derive a demand curve. But that demand curve can be perverse because you're getting a higher income out of the drop in price effectively. So you assume in doing this though, that you can vary price without varying income. And that therefore means that pivot point which shows your income on the vertical axis remains where it is. It doesn't change as you move the prices. Now you then compensate for the higher income by moving those new uh, budget lines back to where they're all tangential to the same indifference curve and from that you can derive the Hicksian compensated demand curve. And that necessarily slopes down because you're simply describing the shape of one curve. Now the SMD condition said, well, that works for an individual. What about when there's more than one person? And the answer is no, it doesn't work anymore. <coughs> and the logic is fairly simple because, of course, we're assuming initially that varying price doesn't vary income. But in a neoclassical model, prices of commodities determine the incomes of those who sell them. So of course changing prices does change incomes, even when you're talking about initial endowments rather than production. So let's now set up our conditions to say we're going to try to, to prove that a market demand curve slopes downwards just like an individual one does. We have to start from two consumers and those two consumers have to have different sources of income and different tastes, otherwise we're really just talking about one consumer. We're pretending that there, there's more than one unless we say they have different tastes and different incomes. And also those tastes have to change with income. The ratio in which you consume two com the commodities must vary with income, otherwise there's only one commodity. You're kidding yourself if you imagine you can increase income and not change the relative consumption patterns in your own budget. So we start with the two consumer, two commodity world. I'm going to choose Man, uh, uh, Robinson Crusoe and Man Friday. And my two commodities are going to be coconuts and bananas, the sorts of things you might find on, on a desert island. And Crusoe is going to own all the bananas, and Friday owns all the coconuts. We actually have a, a non-slave society here. And coconuts are the necessity, and bananas are the luxury. That's the starting point. And Friday, as it happens, has a higher preference for coconuts than Crusoe. That's your starting position. So I've now defined a two commodity, two person world. And I'm saying what actually happens when we try to work out what the demand curve is for the market as a whole. Well, we start with an arbitrary price ratio for both consumers. The same price ratio, obviously. And then we keep the aggregate income constant. We're not changing the number of coconuts or the number of bananas. This is an endowment model. <coughs> but I consider a lower price for bananas now. What actually happens? Well, they change the slope, obviously, to make it flatter so you can buy more bananas per coconut. But that means Crusoe, who's actually selling the bananas, his income falls. And in relative terms, Friday's rises. So the new budget line for Crusoe is going to be down there somewhere where the new budget line for Friday is going to be up there somewhere. And it's quite possible that market demand for bananas could fall because of the lower price. Because Crusoe's income has fallen and Friday's has risen but Friday prefers coconuts to bananas. So there could be a fall in the, in the demand for bananas because of the price of bananas has fallen. Not what you want. What about if you try to compensate now for the, for the change in prices? So you keep relative prices constant, but now you increase income equally. So I'm equally increasing the number of coconuts and the number of bananas on the island in proportion. So I start from that ratio and I then move the curve out. But because bananas are a luxury and coconuts are a necessity, the demand for bananas is going to rise more than the demand for coconuts. So Crusoe's income will rise more than Friday's does. 
So you can't compensate for the income effect either. You can't separate it out. A uniform increase in income will change the distribution of income. As a result of that, imagine the curve you'd be drawing by following all those perturbations as I change price. It could have any shape at all. The, the vertical point, the fixed vertical point in your micro model is moving up and down. The, the slope from that point is moving all that is changing as well. You can draw any line you like as a point of tangency when you add those two people's preferences together. So the law of demand is not obeyed unless you assume all consumers have identical tastes, which means there's only one consumer, or you assume tastes don't change with income, which means there's only one commodity. So you've contradicted your starting point, and therefore you know the law of demand does not apply for a market <coughs> demand curve. Now what that means, uh, I'll, I'll show some quotes about how neoclassical economists have reacted to this. It's clearly what they should have done is say, we must abandon supply and demand analysis because we can't work out an equilibrium price anymore. There's multiple potential intersections. It can't be equilibrium, must be dynamics in some sense. And people like Alan Kerman thought about it very carefully and Alan said that we actually may be forced to stop working from the isolated individual. Because though it's very silly to add together a capitalist and a worker, Crusoe and Friday, and try to work out a demand curve from both of them by assuming they're exactly the same, it, it does make sense to lump all capitalists together and all workers together. Because capitalists are likely to consume similar things to each other, and workers are likely to consume similar things to each other, so you should work at a high level of aggregation. In effect, what Sam Kirk and Kerman is saying is that neoclassical economics has proven the classical school of economics was correct to use social classes. That's not how they've reacted, of course. And this is Schaefer and Sonnenschein. Sonnenschein being, of course, one of the two who discovered the conditions. And he wrote that strong, they, 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 they haven't understood their own proof, fundamentally but he's still saying you can't use the abstraction of a representative agent. And that's in the handbook of mathematical economics. Not exactly a left-wing obscure publication somewhere. This is what neoclassical economists should have read. But instead what they've done is react like this. This is the first person who discovered it. Gorman, writing in, in the year I was born, it's bizarre that this is not known commonly. And he went through and said, well, working in terms of angle curves, which show how income, how consumption changes as income rises, we can get around the problem by assuming that all consumers have got the same angle curves. And he then says, and I find this bizarre, the necessary and sufficient conditions, quote above, is intuitively reasonable. It says, in effect, that an extra unit of purchasing power will be spent in the same way no matter to whom it is given. That's not reasonable. That's stupid. That's truly absurd. But that's the sort of thing neoclassical economists who are aware of this problem have done to try to get around the fact they've disproven their starting point. And the textbooks reproduce the same rubbish. This is Samuelson and Nordhaus saying, does the market demand curve obey the law of demand? It certainly does. Now that's provably false. Samuelson actually believed he proved it, by the way. But what he did was, he assumed the American economy operates as one big happy family, where the wealthy redistribute their income to the poor to make them feel better. And I ask in the book at one point, did the man even live in the United States? That he could have that sort of fantasy. Varian, who dominated the teaching of masters and PhD students for some time, says it's sometimes convenient, but then he says the conditions under which you can do this are rather stringent, but discussing them lies beyond the scope of this book. Don't worry about it, just assume you can do it. This is where a lot of the neoclassical nonsense has come from. 
Now the real meaning of the SMD conditions from my point of view are that macroeconomics is an emergent property. It's not something you can derive from micro. It's an independent level of analysis in its own right. And it really should be the focus of economics too. And this comes from something which is quite commonly known in science, that you can't build up a high level of analysis, like for example a chemistry, from a lower level like physics. They're independent intellectual areas. So what economists are committing is what I call, and what is known in science as well, as the fallacy of strong reductionism. And they believe that macroeconomics is applied micro. That was the point of uh, Olivia uh, Blanchard's quote in the first slide. But they've actually proven that's not true. Now, I go into this fallacy in detail in the chapter in macroeconomics in the second edition of Debunking Economics. Uh, but that's common knowledge in science. This is a very important paper by a, tr a real Nobel Prize winner. This man won the Nobel Prize in physics. That's a real Nobel Prize, unlike the economics one, which is a pretend Nobel Prize. And he wrote a very important paper called More is Different because scientists started discovering this effect that aggregating small units gives you different behaviour at the aggregate level than you get at the individual. They began discovering that in the 60s, 1960s and 1970s. And he said what they've now proven is the behaviour of large and complex aggregates do not behave like a grown-up elementary particle. And at each new level, the, 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 the scale causes a new level of complexity which requires a new level of analysis. And he makes this wonderful statement where he says you might actually put the sciences in a table where you say the elementary particles of science X obey the laws of science Y. So he says chemistry, for example, obeys many body physics and molecular biology obeys chemistry and so on. And he finally says the social sciences might obey psychology. He said this hierarchy does not imply that science X is just applied Y. At each new level, entirely different principles will arise and you need new inspiration and new creativity of an equal degree as, as in the previous level. And of course that applies in economics. Macroeconomics is not applied micro. Now, the reason they've maintained this fallacy is there are several reasons. I see one as being poor scholarship. If most economics Nobel Prize winners sat in one of my courses in history of economic thought and submitted as an essay what they write in the journals, I would fail them. That includes Paul Krugman. Poor technique. They think they're being fancy, but they're using stuff which physicists actually think <coughs> has been written by Monty Python. It's such a comedy from a physics point of view. And there's ideology as well, which they deny they're ideological, but fundamentally everything they do end up being a effectively right-wing ideology. So the poor scholarship, they don't even, they don't read anything other than their textbooks. Now, I'm not critical of them, believe it or not, for this, because you have a right, as a student, as many of you are, to accept that your textbooks accurately reflect the research on which your discipline is based. And in physics, and chemistry, and engineering, and other sciences, generally speaking, that's true. So a physicist doesn't go and read Einstein's original papers to make sure his textbook explained E equals MC squared properly. Quite a valid way to behave. The trouble is, what is true of sciences is not true of economics. Because the textbooks themselves pretend the theory has been vindicated when it hasn't been, or more likely, the textbook writers themselves don't know that the theory has been contradicted. They are also superficially aware of their own discipline. And they certainly don't know the rival traditions of Marx, Schumpeter, Minsky and so on. So um, again, a few quotes to give you an idea of this. On poor scholarship, here's Solo. Now I'm using Solo, as you saw, as a way of attacking DSGE models. And what he's accusing them of is bad scholarship. If they'd read his papers and asked him, they would never have tried to design macroeconomics using his growth model. But here is him talking about his own education in the same paper. And he said the main framework under which I learned was Keynesian, 
Look at this next sentence. I use that label simply for convenience. I have absolutely no interest in what Keynes really meant. In other words, the bad scholarship he's complaining about other neoclassicals applying to him, he implied to Keynes. It's no wonder economics is in the mess it is, given how little respect we have for the history of our own discipline. And what I'd call rabid neoclassicals, people like Lucas and Sargent, at least Robert uh, Solo engaged in the Cambridge controversies. He had a very unpleasant time with Joan Robinson, so I can forgive him to some extent for having the attitudes he has. Uh, but at least he engaged in debate over the Cambridge controversies, and at least he's aware of the need for good scholarship as it applies to his own model. But people like Lucas and Sargent have no concept whatsoever of that. And one of the great joys for me in being in this crisis now is that neoclassical economists were so triumphant during what we call the Great Moderation that they would make triumphant statements like this in public, and I can now use it against them. So here is, here is uh, uh, Lucas giving a speech to the History of Economic Thought Society in America, off the cuff. And you can see, he says, before he came along, he thought some people might argue on Axel Leinhofer's case that Hicks's ISLM model was a distortion of Keynes. But he said, nobody said it to me so far, so I'm going to pretend that ISLM and Keynes are the same thing. And he said, again, when he first read Leinhofer's book, which is on Keynesian economics and the economics of Keynes, which criticises ISLM as a very bad model of Keynes, said, when that book first came out, Lucas asked Becker, another Nobel Prize winner, what he thought was, was Leinhofer right? Did, did, was, did Hicks correctly convey Keynes with the ISLM model? And Becker says to him, as you can see from that quote, well, I don't know, but I sure hope he did because I would never have made any sense of that damn book if it wasn't for Hicks. <coughs> In other words, Gary Becker didn't understand the general theory, and neither does Robert Lucas. Now, the general theory is not an easy book, and in some ways it's not a good book. But if you can't understand it, you're going to be a lousy economist, and that's where we've ended up being. Now, Hicks, this is the crazy thing. If he'd read the literature, he would have seen that one person who concluded that e economics had, that he, the ISLM model had not captured Keynes properly was the person who invented it, John Hicks. Writing almost 25 years before Lucas gave that speech, Hicks rejected his own model. And the reason is because of equilibrium analysis, amongst many other factors. Again, I've discussed this in great detail in debunking economics. But Hicks points out that he used Volrazian concepts to eliminate other markets that should be there. For example, has it never struck you as strange that a model of macroeconomics doesn't have a labour market in it? Why is there no labour market in the basic ISLM model? It's because in Walrasian general equilibrium, Hicks believed he could omit the labour the labour market because if the IS and the LM markets were in equilibrium, so is the labour market. But if you're in disequilibrium, the labour market is going to exist. You can't forget it anymore. It won't be in equilibrium either. So on that basis, the whole use of equilibrium technology for macro was wrong. Now, neoclassicals, on the other hand, believe you can't model unless you assume equilibrium, which is ridiculous because all they have to do is sit in a physics class or an engineering class, and they'll see that all the way through the modelling they're being taught is how to model disequilibrium systems. In fact, if you have a system in general equilibrium, in engineering, it doesn't move. Nothing happens in equilibrium, properly defined. Now, I find, it, again, remarkable how ignorant economists are, not just of their own discipline, but other disciplines as well. And, of course, we now have a new textbook by... A, a, a uh, Spanish author, Mascalel, dominating PhD education today. Is anybody here using Mascalel right now? Okay. Have a look on, you'll, you'll see this quote from Mascalel, and I'll, I'll give the page reference here. 
And he says a characteristic of our analysis is equilibrium. He said other sciences put more on dynamics. He said the reason, informally speaking, is that economists are rather good for recognising a position of equilibrium, or so we hope. What a load of nonsense. It's not a case of recognising it, it's assuming that it exists. That's on page 620. Have a good read. Now, if you go back to the 19th century and look forward, what did 19th century economists think 20th century economists would do? They thought they'd develop dynamic analysis. This is J.B. Clark, writing in 1898. And he thought the, 19, the 20, 1900s would be when we rephrased economics using dynamic techniques. And he made the obvious state heroically theoretical. It's the study that treats the, the economy as static. It's truly dynamic. We must use dynamic technology all the way through. Now, of course, that never happened with neoclassicals. And again, I think ideology plays a major role. Uh, for the interest in time, I'll skip over that quote, but I'll leave those in the presentation for later. I think many of the fallacies arrive from not just ideology, but what I call te teleology, having a conclusion you wish to reach, having a belief system you wish to maintain, similar to ideology. So, for example, money neutrality. That's assumed as part of macroeconomic theory. Rational expectations. I put the word in inverted commas very deliberately. Now, they're both needed. You need both those assumptions to reach the conclusion that capitalism is inherently stable and also that the state can't improve market outcomes. Now, they're maintained despite the fact you need patently ridiculous assumptions to hold on to them. And again, this turns up in the literature. So here's Lucas talking about rational expectations back in the very first paper in which he introduced it into macroeconomics in 1972. And he explains the reason he invented, he brought this from micro where Muth first used it into macro, is that he wanted to maintain the belief that the, the vertical, the Phillips curve was vertical in the long run. In other words, you could do nothing to move the natural rate of unemployment. Government policy couldn't reduce unemployment systemically for the indefinite future. Maybe the short term, but not, not indefinite future. And he said adaptive expectations actually means you can do that because all you have to do is keep on accelerating the rate of growth of the money supply and you will fool people into believing that demand is higher than it actually is and therefore they will work harder and the unemployment rate will fall. And you can keep it that way. So he said the only way you can avoid that outcome is if the expected rate of inflation in the future is correctly anticipated by agents today. That's what that expression there means. There's no gap between the actual rate of inflation when it happens and the expectation of it back in the past before we arrived at the, the, the present time. And he says, if that is if the impossibility of that being anything other than zero is taken as a necessary part of the natural rate hypothesis, one is led to adding the assumption that the expected rate will equal the actual rate as an axiom. In other words, we assume people can predict the future. But that's too stupid even for an economist, a neoclassical economist, to think he can fool the audience with. So the next sentence is where rational expectations come from. Or to assume expectations are rational in the sense of mirth. So fundamentally what rational expectations means is that you have the capacity for accurate prophecy. That is not rational. It is in fact madness. But that's what we've kitted ourselves to believe as rational expectations. So it's wrong from first principles. For a start, it treats a complex system of monetary exchange as just a system of barter. And I, I try to use analogies as much as I can to get this point across to people. To me, trying to model capitalism as if there's no money in it is a bit like trying to model how a bird flies by assuming it, ha it hasn't got wings. Well, good luck. It's a stupid endeavour. It's got wings. Capitalism has money. 
Our analysis must be monetary and certainly of macroeconomics. It assumes the macroeconomy is stable. Now, I am not being critical, critical of capitalism per se to say that it's unstable because part of the instability, as Schumpeter argued a long time ago, gives us the creativity that means that I'm playing with a device like this to give my lecture while you're listening in remote control microphones and probably as some of you are playing with your iPads and your iPhones. That's where technological change, instability comes from, that's, where, that's what gives us technological change. But of course there's other forms of instability like the one we're in now which is not good. It ignores social class when they're proven they should take social class seriously. And of course it obliterates uncertainty by the belief that we can all predict the future accurately. And it's also using an empirically falsified model, model of money creation, the money multiplier. Now that is still taught in textbooks. Ben Bernanke obviously convinced Obama that's how the economy worked when it came to Obama's rescue pro uh, program into 2009. But we know it's not right and it ignores the role of credit and debt. So we need a new macroeconomics and that's partially what I go on to in the new edition of debunking economics as well, putting forward an, an alternative approach to macroeconomics. And that treats the economy as inherently monetary. So you must, you're, you're, you must model the economy using monetary flows and I mean real nominal money, pardon me, nominal money not real, not deflated by the CPI, I mean actual dollar notes. It has to be a dynamic model using social classes, not agents. Individual, what is called methodological individualism cannot work because of that property of strong reductionism. You can't produce the economy working up from agents. I even think multi-agent modelling, heterogeneous multi-agent modelling has great difficulties because of that, let alone what neoclassicals do. And you've got to have rational but not prophetic behaviour. So people react knowing what they know in their own interests as they perceive them but in, a, in an era of uncertainty. So they extrapolate forward what they believe today <coughs> and have endogenous money creation and credit and debt playing essential roles. Now the foundation of all this is Hyman Minsky's financial instability hypothesis. So I'll take you through that hypothesis and then give you a mathematical model of it as well. And again, to spend more time on the modelling, I'll just jump those quotes there. So it's fundamentally a disequilibrium monetary model. And he starts with the economy in historical time. Now I emphasise both those words because both history and time are left out of neoclassical economics. If you're in historical time, then there's been a crisis in the recent past. And a good one for us to think about today would be the 1990 recession in America. Because that crisis has occurred, both firms and banks are conservative about how much debt they'll allow. Okay. It's not, uh, as Stiglitz would put it across, uh, information asymmetry, it's symmetry of belief. They both believe they've got to be conservative and cautious. But because the economy has recovered, let's say we're thinking about 1993, 1994 now, most of those projects succeed. And because they succeed, people think, oh, we were too conservative. If we'd borrowed more money, we would have made a larger levered gain. So they increase the level of debt they're willing to consider and they, they put a high valuation on assets as well. And Minsky has a classic phrase here. I've taken out the beginning and the end of the phrase. He says, stability in a capitalist economy with sophisticated finance and an uncertain future is destabilising. So a period of tranquil economic growth, because that's the exception in capitalism rather than the norm, a period of tranquil economic growth means capitalist expectations rise. Therefore, they're willing to invest more when conditions are tranquil. So for a while, you get self-fulfilling expectations. More investment takes place. And that causes the economy to grow faster, which validates some of the investment. But ultimately you get to what Minsky calls the euphoric economy. And this is where expectations are incredibly po positive. And asset prices also are rising dramatically. 
and the money supply has expanded. The, the, I'll, I'll explain this in a moment. But the money supply endogenously expands to meet the, meet the demands put on upon it by the, finan by the, by the uh, community. And that enables riskier investments still and drives asset prices up as well. And it also leads to the emergence of what Minsky calls Ponzi financiers. Now, a Ponzi financier is someone who, has a, who buys assets with borrowed money and the debt servicing costs on the loan exceeds the cash flow of the business. So unless they can sell the business for a profit, they're going to go bankrupt. So they necessarily require more and more debt over time. How do they succeed? By selling assets on a rising market. So for a while, they've become fabulously successful when the prices are rising. But they also desperately need money because if they don't get new debt, they can't roll over the accumulated debt they've got plus the interest charges they haven't been able to service completely. So they'd fold. So they desperately need more money. They drive up the demand for money. And of course, when this is happening, banks are very willing to lend to them because they look so successful. Now those rising debt levels on unprofitable investments and also potentially rising interest rates lead to a crisis because some of those projects do fall over. Ponzi's do fold before the crisis hits. And rising rates make a lot of conservatively estimated projects risky as well. So non-Ponzi investors sell their assets to try to service debt and the, the growth in asset prices stops and Ponzi's go bankrupt. But they simply can't sell assets on a market anymore and they can't roll over their debt. So asset prices collapse, the expansion of the money supply goes into reverse, investment evaporates, the economy slows down and you're back where you started again. You're back in a debt-induced recession. Now that's the basic flowchart of Minsky's thinking. And debt, it will start again when debt levels have been reduced, but they won't fall back to where they started from because a range of things apply. Expectations recover before you've paid the debt back down to its beginning point. And in a simple sense, firms borrow money during a boom but have to repay it during a slump. So they have less cash flow than they expect to have when they service the debt and pay it off. So you get a tendency for the debt to cycle up through a series of humps. And you get a final crisis when you get to the point where there's so much debt that the economy is overwhelmed. And that's where we are now. So modelling that, I start from an inherently cyclical model. Capitalism is cyclical. So we need a cyclical model to start our analysis. And in my opinion, the best model was derived by Richard Goodwin back in 1967, which he called the growth cycle. And it's actually quite simple to show in a flowchart. It starts off by saying the level of capital stock determines the level of income. And I'm now building a flowchart beneath each of the text lines there. The level of income determines employment given labour productivity. The number of workers hired determines the employment rate given population. And that then determines the rate of change of wages, a Phillips curve relationship. I'm using a linear one here simply for purposes of illustration. Integrate the rate of change of wages and you get the, the actual wage. Multiply that by labour and you get the wage bill. Subtract that from output and you get profit. And in the simple model Goodwin put together, all profit is invested. So you integrate profit and you get <coughs> capital. And that takes you back up where you started again. And when you simulate it, you get a model that behaves like this. There are cycles in employment and income distribution, indefinite cycles. So I took that model as a starting point and added some realism to it. Because, of course, firms don't invest all their profits. They invest more than their profits during a boom and less than their profits during a slump. And, of course, they borrow when they go beyond their profits. They pay off debt when they're down below that level. And also, of course, Ponzi financiers borrow not to invest but to speculate. So they borrow money, but they don't build factories using that money. So you get that ratcheting up process when you add those two elements of reality to the model. 
and I'll just quickly simulate it for you. Quickly, has anybody seen software that looks like this before? Dynamic modeling flowchart software? Okay. Go and do a course in systems engineering. This is commonplace for engineers. This is how they build the cars you drive in now, the planes you fly in, the nuclear power stations that occasionally blow up on you, but nonetheless provide power. So this, this is a very serious modeling tool here. And I've built that model, I've shown you, and I can simulate it dynamically. Okay. And if I simulate it, well, I, I get a cycles, as you can see, like the, the very bottom graph, you can see the cycles are a bit like the one beforehand, only they're open. What actually goes on there a series of booms and busts as I described, the level of debt rising in a series of humps compared to GDP, and finally the level of non-productive Ponzi debt overwhelming the economy and it collapses. <coughs> so it's possible to put Minsky's verbal model into a mathematical <coughs> form. And fundamentally this is a system of five differential equations shown as a flowchart. This is the sort of thing we should be doing as macroeconomists modelling this way rather than with static equilibrium concepts. Now, part of what comes out of my analysis as well is the argument that the level of debt and the change of debt play a vital role in capitalism. Sometimes a necessary role, other times a destructive one. And neoclassicals, on the other hand, start from Volra's law, which says that effectively all spending is financed by selling commodities. So sales, supply precedes and causes demand. And in that case, there's no role for credit. But looking at the empirical data and also what's called the theory of endogenous money, we can argue that aggregate demand is not just aggregate supply, it's aggregate supply plus the change in debt. Fundamentally growing debt finances both investment by genuine investors and borrowing by Ponzi schemers. And genuine investors spend the borrowed money in, on capital goods and Ponzi schemers spend it driving up asset prices. So a second stage of this is to argue that if, if aggregate demand is income plus the change in debt, then the change in aggregate demand is the change in income plus the acceleration of debt. And that's called the credit accelerator. So Volra's law is inadequate for a credit economy. It's true if there's no money and no credit. It's false when you bring in money and look at dynamics on top of that. You find this in Marx and Schumpeter. So I'll just quickly put some quotes up here for you to go to reference them later. This is Marx explaining that rather than Volra's law applying for a capitalist, they try to make the gap between their supply and demand as large as possible. And Schumpeter explaining that growing debt is what finances entrepreneurs. And therefore, Volra's law is false in a growing economy. And finally, Minsky making the point that if you're going to have growing aggregate demand over time, then debt must be rising. Leaving out even the Ponzi schemers, to have a growing economy, you have to have growing debt. Now, in our growing economy, that change, aggregate demand is spent not just buying goods and services, which is all macro looks at, it's spent buying claims on existing assets as well. So finance and economics are blended, you cannot separate the two. And I define aggregate demand as being, as I said, income plus the change in debt, and what it's spent on is goods and services plus existing assets. And you can then break existing assets down into three components, the price level, the proportion of assets that are sold every year and the number of assets. So then going on to the second stage and saying what about the change in aggregate demand, that is equal to the change in income plus the acceleration of debt and that will then be have a link to the change in GDP 
plus the change in asset prices fundamentally. So you need accelerating debt to have rising asset prices. And that's what we've been caught up in the last 40 years. Accelerating debt has actually driven share markets and house prices as high as they've gone. Now neoclassicals falsely believe that the level of debt makes no difference because they think what happens with the debt is if somebody saves money and hands it over to somebody who borrows, the saver's spending power declines, the borrower's spending power rises, there's no aggregate effect. This is Krugman from 2010 and 2011 saying just that. Now they're wrong because debt is created by banks out of nothing. There's an expansion in debt so that a borrower getting additional debt to finance money does not mean a saver has to lose spending power. Endogenous creation of money is the norm. And here's um, just looking at how big debt has got to be in America in the last uh, 60 years. The red, that, that, that is the ratio of private debt to GDP in America. And as you can see, the peak we reached is just over 300%, and that's higher than the peak level of debt during the Great Depression. Now, the bursting of the debt bubble back in the Great Depression is what caused the Great Depression, and we're going through the same process now. So it is fundamentally valid to compare what we're going through now to the Great Depression. And if you then take a look at the relationship between the change in debt and employment, <coughs> I've turned unemployment upside down so you can see the correlations here. That's the correlation between change in debt and unemployment in the 1920s and the 1930s. So both the boom and the bust. That's the correlation between 1990 and now. <coughs> the correlation coefficients are huge. Minus 0.96 in the current data in the last 20 years. So there's a strong causal link between change in debt and the level of economic activity. Now we have a bigger crisis than we had back in the Great Depression, but one thing that's making it less extreme is non-financial corporations are not in as much debt now as they were back in the Great Depression. Again, I explain that in more detail in my book. And of course the government response has been far bigger and far faster. Now, this is looking at the second stage of this analysis, which is the relationship between uh, the acceleration of debt and change in employment. That's the 1920s data. That's today's data. If you take a look, by the way, at how deep the downturn in credit was, in the 1930s, minus 15 roughly was the peak level. Today it's minus 25. So the scale of the downturn now is bigger than the Great Depression. And again, the correlations are enormous given the nature of the data I'm looking at. The share market is the same. That's the correlation between accelerating debt and change in the Dow Jones back in the 1920s. That's the relationship today. So accelerating debt is what drives asset prices. It's ridiculous to get a correlation that high given how volatile share markets are. So again, strong empirical confirmation that this hypothesis, which emanates from Minsky, makes sense of what we're going through now. <coughs> now, one of the paradoxes of our situation right now too is that because acceleration of debt adds to aggregate demand when it's positive, if you're going, if you're reducing debt but you reduce it less rapidly, your debt level is actually accelerating. So slowdowns in the rate of re reduction in debt can actually stimulate the economy. And that gives us, it looks like a recovery is coming and then it disappears when the acceleration goes negative again. So all these three factors, the level of debt, which, which tells you the pressure on the economy, the rate of change of debt, which tells you how much changing debt is adding to aggregate demand, and the acceleration, which tells you the growth direction, they all matter. So what I'm now going to finish with is showing you how I've put together Minsky's model and a model of endogenous money. I've taken the, the Goodwin cycle I showed you a moment ago, 
and Minsky, as I've also shown you, and include circuit theory, which comes out of European economists like Augusto Graziani, and what I call the product is monetary circuit theory. Now, I'll quickly um, get to the, the basics of the whole idea, and that is this is how money is actually created. An entrepreneur approaches a bank and says, I have a great idea. And the bank says, yes, we agree, it's a great idea. Here's a million dollars. By the way, you owe us a million dollars. Double entry bookkeeping is what creates money. And we've known that empirically since the, since the late 1960s. Here's an ex-vice president of the research in the Federal Reserve in New York making a very simple statement about how money is created. He says, in the real world, banks extend credit, creating deposits in the process, and look for the reserves later. So the money multiplier theory that turns that back to front is all wrong. And plenty of empirical evidence to support that. Now, I've built a way of modelling this uh, dynamically, so I'll quickly show you what I'm talking about. I'll show you this to scare you, first of all, because <coughs> there is some technical mouse behind it, but then show it's quite simple too. I can input the financial relationships in a table like this. So if you imagine a, a bank lending from a vault, it takes money out of its reserve and transfers it to the firms. That's minus A to A in the first row. Then it records the loan. That's plus A in the second row. Then it charges interest. That's plus B in the third row. Then the firm pays interest by transferring money from its account to the bank's safe. That's minus B to plus B in the fourth row, and so on. Put that through a simulation program, and it generates this sort of system of equations without you knowing you're doing it. Now, that's the scary bit. What I want to show you is how it can be done using a software package I'm developing now with the help of a grant from George Soros's Foundation for New Economic Research. I'll just move the microphone around so you can hear me. Ah, I hope that works. So you can now see I've started with that first row, the A to minus A. I hope that stays good. Okay. I'm going to add another row and call this one charge interest. And that's going to be B added to the loans and then pay the interest which is going to be minus B taken out of the firm's account and paid across to the bank's safe. And then record the payment by the bank, which means you reduce the loan by minus B. Now what I need to do after doing that is to find what B is. So I'm going to say B, of course, is going to be the re equal to the rate of interest on loans multiplied by the amount of money in the loans account at time T, or the amount of debt in the loan account. And then I've got to say what the rate of interest is. So I'm going to find that as being 5%. And having done that, I can now generate a diagram that looks like a, well it's a flowchart type diagram, pardon me, and say so bring in those new relationships I've just defined. I haven't included workers yet in the model, I'll do that later. There's the safe where the firm pays the interest to. There's the loans where you record the payment, there's charging interest on it, and there's recording the loan in the first instance. And if I now move this around, you'll see the money flowing out of the vault, pouring into the firm, and then being transferred across to the safe. And I'll speed it up a bit. So ultimately, in that system, ultimately all the money ends up in the safe. But you can see I'm dynamically modelling the process there. Now, of course, that's not a complete system. So I'll load one that is, and this involves 
now bringing in the Minsky model I've shown you beforehand. And that now includes population dynamics, productivity, capital level, wages, the price level and so on. So I can now bring up a whole lot of other elements of capitalism. This is only a very basic model, but it, what I can show you is it actually simulates what we've seen happen, not just in the recent period, but in the what, was the, what neoclassical economists called the Great Moderation. And what they were looking at is this top left-hand chart, where you can see the unemployment rate and inflation both heading down over time, which they thought was a sign of successful policy. What was actually happening was a rising level of debt compared to GDP. The Minsky process was in operation with those cycles, as you can see. And as time went on, the level of debt starts to overwhelm the economy, so you go into serious deflation and unemployment starts to rise. And then if you don't have bankruptcy, which I'm not modelling in this, in this particular model, ultimately the economy collapses completely. Debt overwhelms the economy, economic activity ceases, unless you allow for bankruptcy. So quite complicated models can be built using this technology with not a lot of effort. So here's a slightly more complicated model again. Actually, I'll bring up another one. Simply modelling a sustainable capitalist economy where I have workers consuming, banks consuming, firms repaying debt and so on. All extremely easy to use. I've had my first year students doing this, using this program and building a model within 10 minutes, which is a bit better than you get by trying to teach somebody macroeconomics using neoclassical concepts. So to me, this is the future, and it's quite extensible. It can handle multiple commodities, as I'll show you in a moment, and multiple countries as well, all in nominal monetary terms. I'll stop that. So these are all the, I've gone very quickly through those details there so we have a time for discussion. Now the mathematics behind it is actually all this. It's a set of 14 differential equations there. I'd hate to try to teach that to first year students. But they understand quite easily the flow system I've shown you a moment ago. And I also generate the stylized dynamics of the crisis. This is now looking at the aggregate data for America smooth. So I've taken out the extreme cycles. I've got the smooth level of unemployment, inflation and level of debt to GDP. This is my model simulation. It's qualitatively very similar. So I think our objective should be qualitative capturing of the nature of capitalism first before we try to predict the future. But certainly catching that is quite possible. That's coming out in the Journal of Economic Behaviour and Organisation later on this year, I hope. So that modelling program I've shown you is freely downloadable from my blog and I'm working on a more advanced version now which is almost ready to release a prototype version. And it also scales as I've mentioned. I can do multiple commodities, multiple input-output dynamics. So what Volra tried to do without money in the 19th century is quite doable with modern technology. I've got a multi multi dynamic multi-sectoral model of production with cycles in profits, shares, <coughs> GDP and so on, debt dynamics, all easily built out of that same framework. And I've now worked out how to extend that to multiple countries and uh, international trade and financial flows as well. But it will take quite a while before I do it. So much more to economics than the nonsense we've taught ourselves so far. We have to liberate ourselves from the old ways of thinking and that's the primary purpose of my debunking economics. And I hope you enjoy it if you read it. Thank you.
first question I'll get a set of data outside. <laughs> Bien, hemos tenido una, creo que una prolongada y muy interesante exposición. Yo creo que el profesor King ha hecho honor a su apellido. Eh, el, el apellido King, el nombre, la palabra King en inglés quiere decir alguien agudo. Este, creo que ha sido. Este, este, ha respondido a, sus a, la, a nuestras expectativas. Eh, creo que ha sido una exposición muy interesante, muy provocativa y muy amplia. Eh, probablemente haya eh, varias preguntas de parte de ustedes. Eh, no sé si tenemos micrófono disponible. Eh, en tal caso, yo diría que hagan las preguntas en inglés. Si las pueden hacer en inglés bien, si no, que hagan las castellano, yo las traduzco eh, online en inglés. Sorry. I'm getting a translation, it's good. <laughs> Thank you. Una pregunta? I have a question. Um, do you think that microbiology is really going to change? I mean, the, the mainstream is really going to change? I, that's a very good question. And the answer is, you leave them to their own devices, categorically, no. They'll stay exactly as they are now until such times we're back in caves again. Um, so the only uh, way you can actually get change is that there's a serious economic crisis that persists for much longer. The first of all, it occurred that they didn't, we weren't expecting it, and persists for much longer than they would ever expect it. And at some point, even they will despair. They won't change their minds, but they might retire. And fundamentally, that's, that's what happened in the Great Depression. I used to wonder, why was it the general theory came out in 1936? You think of it, it, almost the end of the Great Depression, several years to go, but you know, there were seven years or six years before. And I realised that I don't know that Keynes timed it that way, but he, he did have drafts back in 1933. If he'd released the book back in 1933, he would have been ignored, because there was still the belief we're going to get out of this problem and recover and so on. You have to wait until such time as they're in complete despair, and even if they don't believe that they should change, they're not able to defend the fact that they won't change. And then what you've got to rely upon is people like yourself, who are substantially younger than me, so I hope this applies. Because Max Planck once Max Planck had to do a similar thing in physics. He derived quantum mechanics simply by trying to find a mathematical solution to the black body radiation problem and ended up finding he could only solve it if he worked with energy in discrete units or quanta. And he tried to explain it to his colleagues, showed it solved the problem. None of them could cope with it. And he finally said that science advances one funeral at a time. because if you have asset price appreciation going on, asset prices might rise, as they did in Australia, for example, in 1987, by 80% in one year. If you can buy shares with borrowed money at the beginning of the year, and, and even if you're paying 25% rate of interest, and sell them before the, before the bubble bursts, you make a fortune. So it attracts investment away from genuine investment and towards speculation. So, and, and that comes out of the fact that banks, fundamentally, can't make a lot of money unless they create a lot of debt. The, the, the real limit on how much profit banks can make is the amount of debt they can create. And the limit on the amount of debt they can create is our willingness to go into debt. Now, if you, if you look at going into debt for, for income purposes, you don't go into a great deal of debt. Um, I gave an example in last night's talk that 
in 1990, the level of personal debt in Australia compared to GDP was roughly 10%. 20 years later, it's still roughly 10%. It's moved up and down, but it stayed in that 10% level. Mortgage debt was 17%. It peaked at almost 90%. So you had a five-fold increase in mortgage debt with no change in personal debt. And the reason is people thought that if they borrowed money and bought a house, and the house price rose, they'd make a leave of gain on it. So they're willing to take on more debt if you believe an asset price bubble will return your money to you. So, and, and the fact is the rising debt actually causes the asset price bubble. So we get sucked into a delusion. And that's why it gets more attractive. But of course, ultimately that has to crash because the bubble, for the price level to continue rising, debt has to continue accelerating. And since debt cannot accelerate forever, just like your car can't accelerate forever, when it starts to slow down, the bubble bursts. And then you have a crisis like the one we're in now. So that, that basic positive feedback between accelerating debt and rising asset prices is why Ponzi investing becomes more attractive over time. But it's also why it necessarily leads to a crisis. That's why I think we have to find some way of preventing Ponzi finance behaviour in future. If we don't prevent it, we'll be in another crisis like this in 2070 or 20, 2060. Lo que quería decir primero es que agradezco al profesor, digamos, brindarnos elementos para cuestionar, digamos, este, la, la pero tengo, tengo una, 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 una pregunta difícil de responder quizá, este, que es la siguiente ¿se puede contrastar eh, la teoría económica que intenta explicar una situación de cierto equilibrio con una teoría de las crisis, como la que presenta el profesor, o habría que contrastar esta teoría de Minsky con otras teorías de las crisis que también provienen, digamos, de él, Minsky, como las teorías de las corridas, Krugman, etc. I see the debate between Krugman uh, as a new Keynesian and the new classical school as a bit like the debate in Alice through the looking glass between Tweedledum and Tweedledee. They're so similar, it's ridiculous, and it's only tiny little perturbations that make them look at all different, but Krugman gets extremely worked up about that. They're both equilibrium theories. The only difference is one has a bit of uh, um, imperfect competition thrown in and so on, but it's fundamentally still the same idea. They, they share the same uh, foundation. So I see that as a complete waste of time. And because they're both again believing they can build the model of the economy from the individual agent up. And the only difference is the new Keynesians will have one agent and the new classicals might have two. And the new classicals have perfect competition and the new Keynesians have imperfect competition. It's still the same foundation. It's still equilibrium thinking. So I would prefer to ignore them or hope that they finally die out in the Max Planck sense and start working on genuine disequilibrium modelling. And if you take a good look at how Hicks made his case against ISLM in 1980-81, he fundamentally argued you could not use equilibrium concepts for macroeconomics. And the same thing is in Irving Fisher, of course it's in Sean Pater, Minsky and so on. Uh, the thing is, we have not, because, of, because neoclassical economists have dominated technical training in economics, our students haven't been taught the simple systems for modelling, dynamic systems and engineering and mathematics, differential equations and systems engineering. Once we learn those, it's extremely easy to do dynamic modelling and move away from equilibrium entirely. But to me, it's uh, uh, abandoning neoclassical training in micro and macro and then rebuilding ourselves from the point of view of dynamic systems analysis. Uh, that's what is potential as a way of getting out of the equilibrium trap. But to go back and try to, to modify equilibrium models a bit to make them fit the data better, 
is, I think, a waste of time. And in fact, that's what neoclassicals have done when they've tried to model the financial crisis. They're now bringing in adjustable shocks to an equilibrium model. It's pathetic. We need to move to dynamic modeling completely, and that means abandoning the whole equilibrium debate. I hope that answered the question. I'm not sure that I, I got there. Well, ¿Cuál sería la ecuación de cierre o la ecuación contable que garantiza la consistencia entre las ecuaciones de conducta? ¿Cómo es que garantiza? La, la consistencia de las ecuaciones de conducta, porque es un modelo dinámico en el tiempo. Uh, fundamentally, the accounting balance itself gives you the consistency. Um, there, are two there, there, there are three elements to the system in terms of what can happen. You can have a flow of money from one account to another. You can have an accounting operation recording a flow. Or you can have an accounting operation endogenously creating both money and additional debt. Now, when you put those flows together in the model. If you make an error at any point, the model quite literally explodes on you. The actual dynamics, because you made an error, as economists so frequently do, of putting a stock term where they should have a flow, as soon as you do that, the model gives you ridiculous values, breaks down. So the actual dynamic integrity of the system lets you know whether you've got the model incorrect or not, in the sense that you've actually defined the model to begin with. So that, that is a great check. And then the behaviour, when I model behaviour, what I do is fundamentally take Keynes's arguments in the general theory about how we cope with uncertainty. And he had three arguments. He said we basically extrapolate forward current conditions. We, use, we, we treat the present as a better guide for the future than a candid examination of past experience which show it to have been hitherto. It's a quote from the general theory. So he said it's ir irrational in some sense to do it, and yet there's no other way to cope with the fact that the future is uncertain. We then rely upon existing prices as being accurate, and we fall back upon the judgment of the rest of the world, which is perhaps better informed. So we have herd behaviour. But all those are very easy, sensible ways to model expectations and therefore behaviour, which are part of the model I, I put together. Yeah, uh, I was thinking of uh, developing economies, let's say Argentina mm -hmm. or many countries in the world. Uh, in this kind of model, the uh, structural differences between developed and developing or yeah. underdeveloping mm -hmm. economies are just coefficients, different values for coefficients of other different uh, processes that you need to model. Yeah, I haven't done any work in the modeling developing countries using this framework. I have modeled the impact of relocation of production from a first world to a third world country using a similar framework. And you can get judgments that say what is going to be the impact on each of those economies out of that sort of modeling. So it is feasible, but fundamentally I, uh, Thought we, our understanding of capitalism itself is so bad that we better understand a well-functioning capitalist system first before we try to cover even the behaviour of peripheral country. When you do that, then you're bound to find not just parameter values and so on, but um, transformational issues about society that need to be different. And a lot of that would... If you start modelling in social class terms, then you'd obviously include the role of landlords and landless labourers and so on in your modelling, which of course is a near possible you ignore. And then having that, you'd be looking at dynamics of trying to transform people out of being landless labourers into having land or being employed in the formal sector of the economy and so on. So it's more possible to use this framework to model transformational change than near possible concepts. But I haven't done it yet. I'd be delighted to have someone take on that effort. Yeah. No, no, avanzado la hora que tenemos que entregar el salón a las 11, eh, cerramos acá esta sesión, pido un aplauso de vuelta para el profesor.